name's Dr. David Patrick. I'm a researcher at the University of the Free State in South Africa. Um, I work in the International Studies Group. Um, I first chose to do this round about the 10th of September last year, purely because my PhD, which concerned uh, human rights and genocide abuses, ultimately concerned with ideas of framing and how the, the, the media present ideas to people. Um, and I wanted to try and apply that analysis to the referendum debate. So it's basically, it's been a full year now of, uh, of research. One of the aspects of this that I've had thrown at me is that I've come up with these statistics through some sort of inherent bias on my own part. Now I'd actually say that's not the case. I did go into it looking for bias, but on both sides. I started this project sitting on the no side. You know, I didn't really look enough into it. I was quite ignorant of a lot of the ideas, and I actually, you know, had a, a sort of personal opinion about Alex Salmond, which ultimately was based on what I'd been reading in the papers. Ironically, and after several months of research and actually engaging with these issues, that's what actually turned me from a no voter to a yes voter. And it's actually from looking at this and engaging with the debates and questioning this unchanging narrative that we have been fed from the establishment. You know, because this has been thrown at other researchers in the past and ones who are far more prominent and eminent than I am, is that this comes from a position of like jingoistic, you know, Braveheart style nationalism and that simply isn't the case. I was born in South Croydon, my father and my sister are English, I was educated in England and I have several links and several like fortunate and fond links to England and none of this comes from any sort of like anti-UK or anti-English perspective because the notion of that, especially considering my actual history, is actually insulting and it's actually laughably, you know, inaccurate. Basically the methodology was because the, the referendum question, you know, should Scotland be an independent country, it was a yes or no, it was a binary question. Um, I wanted to look through the articles and uh, see how a selection of the UK press presented this and which side they took, you know, and, and I should state from the start, it's not that they necessarily took a side in every um, every article or every every comment piece or editorial, etc. A lot of them are large body, the, the, the literature was actually in the middle. Um, it was fairly neutral and fairly objective, but there was a weighting towards some, you know, pro-independence ones, and on the other side there was an enormous weighting towards pro-unionist or uh, anti-independence articles, and that's been the case virtually across the entire study. Ultimately, the sort of study that I'm doing at the moment, um, and the one that the actual research has come out and there's been statistics from so far, was based on three things that you might call indicators in the press, or like variables or a section of the press that, depending on how they're presented, they're actually quite important. And the first one, uh, which is probably quite obviously, is the front pages, because the front pages, that's their voice, that's how they you know, project themselves, and also that's their sales technique, that's how they're trying to get you to, to go into your pocket and spend, you know, whatever it is to, to buy one of these. So whatever's on the front page, even if you don't buy it, is important because you've got this passive influence all the time. So I always looked at what's the, if there's an actual article on the front page to do with independence, and obviously this one is very much to do with independence debate. It is a bit ridiculous to be honest, uh, if you, you can um, see, actually read the title on there, Indie Threat to Scots Whiskey, so uh, there's the idea here that you know, a Scottish, uh, a Scottish you know, um, export and, and a Scottish brand which has stood the test of time for hundreds of years would somehow crumble if Scotland was to become an independent country. But in that there, so there you can clearly see there's a, there's a pro-union or anti-independence bias in that. But in, uh, as much as this uh, front page in itself is interesting, it's more when you look at them as a body and the way when, you know, if you, you go through a bus station, you go through a train station, you know, you see other people wear them uh, in the street, you see the headlines on Twitter or on, on, online, etc. is you're getting this passive influence all the time. And what one of the findings that came out in my research was, and this is based on a six month set, um, if you actually look at the headlines on the front pages, there's an enormous weighting towards uh, independence being framed negatively. And one of the main ones is, is whilst there's this body of literature in the middle, it's about 50 odd percent of Upper, upper 40 percent of um, like neutral literature. There's only a tiny body which is positive, but more than around about 50 percent are negative. And if you want to try and put that another way, if you were walking down the street, you're just taking in this passive influence, and you glance up and see a headline on a paper and it's something to do with independence. About it's basically a toss of a coin whether it's going to be negative or neutral. It's very rarely positive. So 50 percent of the time, this passive influence that you take in and you take in and don't really think about was actually telling you that independence is bad. Right, well we've got 
last one, a uh, wee example here for the Daily Record, and it's uh, the after the, the vow, which I always thought was quite funny, and I think I've, a lot of people saw through that. Uh, this document here uh, is truly historic, it's quite ironic that. One of the reasons why you focus on editorials and why I brought it into to my study is because editorials are a really, really important part of a newspaper because they allow the newspaper to talk directly to their readership. Okay, they can basically throw objectivity out the window and it's their individual voice and that's how they, you know, they can actually put forward their own position on uh, campaigns, which you will see right now with the bombing in the Middle East, or they can give themselves a persistent voice on an angle of a certain topic. If we look at the papers that you might be called the UK press as opposed to the Scottish press, so that would be the Daily Telegraph, the Times, the Daily Mail and the Daily Express, is between September 18th last year and uh, March 30th this year, there wasn't a single editorial piece that framed independence positively, so that there was absolutely no balance to the debate. Again, that's not to say that there weren't uh, pieces which were neutral in the framing, but the enormous weighting was towards negative, and if you look at the likes of the Express and the Daily Mail, it, it, and especially the record as well, it amounts to a little more than a campaign, it's like it's almost Orwellian in its scope. And the third part, and this is again, this is this is quite an important part, is this, I'm just using the Telegraph an example here, is comment pieces. And basically anyone who reads a, a newspaper and, and goes through these, you'll notice that there's regular contributors, you know, there's ones that, there's certain ones that every newspaper, you know, commentators, and you know, some of them are quite entertaining, etc. And they, they, they can actually generate a wee bit of fan base. They're very important though, and they're quite revelatory because again, they're in no way objective, and that, that's actually the point. It's supposed to just be someone getting their, their point across, you know, they're actually almost given license to distort facts if they want to. And basically, but because they're given this regular comment, comment piece, it gives them this air of legitimacy, which is actually perhaps misplaced. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, depending on what sources you were looking at, there would be a big difference between some. If you looked at the Scottish titles, such as, um, and even the tabloids did this, such as like the record or the sun, they actually did manage to balance it up. Um, there was always a slight weighting towards the no side, and if you look at the Daily Record, the fact that they gave they give Joan McAlpine a regular column probably results in the fact that they've got that pro-independence bias at times. Um, but it's actually it's, it's a bit of a distortion because it's based on one person who's an MSP. The other aspect that I think is probably notable is if you look at people like uh, Kerry Gill from the Daily Express or Alan Coxon from the Telegraph, is it's almost a personal attack on Alex Salmond the entire time. Is a lot of these views are brought into this. Uh, a lot of debates regarding independence, regarding it could be anything, it could be currency, it could be national identity, it could be defence, it could be government policy. It is all brought down to this uh, this idea that it's Alex Salmond. As I mentioned a few weeks ago when I was speaking at an event in Dundee was that the Sun was a sort of X factor and all this and like you know because it's such an influential paper it's got the biggest readership in the country and that's you know on a UK and Scottish basis it's you know it's got a lot of influence and obviously it's one of the flagship papers in the Murdoch Empire. I'm not saying this from a sort of disappointing perspective but it's almost like they actually dodged the debate they actually tried to um, pull themselves out of it whereas in loads of political debates and loads of campaigns in the last 20 25 years they have actually pushed themselves and centers that have focused themselves right in the middle of it right i mean you've got the headlines you know like the sun what won it you know the last person to leave the uk please turn the lights out they've been put down to actually swinging elections so i thought what are they going to do here and the answer's actually they've done pretty much very little compared to a lot of the other ones okay listen it's essentially i would probably say this is sort of neutral because they haven't really taken an editorial line you can see a few things when you read the article but realistically that's fairly neutral it's you know make a choice and again You've got this one here, this is from the 16th, so this is two days, this is only two days before the vote. And there, you know, the, the story on page one of the most, the biggest selling paper in the country is the fact that there's a cloud that looks a wee bit 
like Scotland's missing, right? And that's that's but that isn't necessarily positive by any means. It's just the fact that they're just trying, you know, to stop the debate and not really take an editorial line. This is the one that I think's most interesting, right? And I don't know if many folk would have picked up on this. Is this is the one from the 18th? So again, a lot of people might have picked up and thought, you know, uh, undecided that day, maybe looking to the sun for a bit of guidance. Why you would ever do that? I have absolutely no idea. But this one, this is quite interesting when you kind of deconstruct it, right? Yes or no? Today's, today's Scotland starts with a blank page, right? That statement in itself just doesn't even make any sense. If there was actually a yes majority, it wouldn't have been a blank page. It would all be a process of negotiation with various bodies and in, uh, in, in government uh, arrangements. Um, and it's a no vote, right? And certainly on the 19th, I didn't feel like we'd woken up with a blank page. We've woken up to the same chapter that has been repeated for decades, okay? And there's no many folk that actually like reading it. And actually, when you actually just take a look at that, yes or no, starts with a blank page. That is the Sun implicitly saying that they are not taking an editorial line and basically that they bottled it. Okay, they're not put, it's put across as almost that, you know, that this is a, a, a decision for the future of our country and, you know, you know, uh, that, that, you know, we're all writing the future together, but actually what they're doing is basically saying we're not taking an editorial line on this. Another aspect, and I'm obviously by no means the first person to comment on this, I mean, I've, I've literally heard this sentiment on my, my Twitter, you know, dozens if not, you know, more than a hundred times today, is this project fear aspect or this constant uh, aspect where it was uh, scare stories, mostly economic scare stories, and ultimately it can be argued that it didn't have an impact on the campaign. I know a lot of these are from the Mail and the Express, and they're quite, uh, quite sort of extreme examples, but it's, it's basically for purposes of illustration. There you go, and I mean, there's no other way to sort of interpret this. There's no, you know, there's no, uh, there's no hidden language here. Independence will cost you, will cost you, fourteen hundred pound, right? All based on conjecture, normally based on the projections of like, you know, the, the OBR or the IFS. Very little of it is actually little more than projections, which are generally not actually based in fact. It's just scaremongering. By the day, we're living in the age of austerity right now. I know people, everyone knows people who haven't tightened their belts and are struggling at the moment. £1,400 is a lot of money to them. Would you risk it? And that's what they're asking. But again, it was just a lie. And this one is from 15th of May. Got there. Scots terror fear over UK split. You know, we've got this sort of soft underbelly idea that Scotland would somehow be a, a sort of backdoor in for, uh, for terrorists. Um, the, again, this is even more so, this is even more important than the sort of economic fear aspect, because this is saying that you're literally in danger. They're saying that you, know, you could actually be targeted by this if Scotland becomes independent. But when you look at the events of the sort of last week and, you know, we're bombing the Middle East, I would imagine that that actually makes us a bigger uh, target for terrorism rather than the fact that, like, Scotland uh, would be independent, but could be wrong there, perhaps. Um, that's another one. This is a sort of linguistic technique that didn't necessarily creep into the, the Scottish media as much. It was still there, but in the, the English media, you know, this, this happened in the, the Telegraph and uh, the, the Times and stuff as well. Is this word here, Nats? Nats, right, okay. And then as much as it is just an abbreviation of nationalists, there is no equivalent abbreviation for the No campaign or Better Together. You don't have, you know, people with, like unionists being shot into like unions or whatever, right? It's only Nats. And again, Apart from the sort of like phonetic and linguistic similarity to comparing like, you know, gnats are essentially insects. It's obviously got those phonetic connotations with, you know, nationalism, the Nazis, etc. And you'll see it when you actually look for it, you see it in everything, you know, cyber gnats, you know, uh, you know, uh, horrific gnats, you know, crazy gnats. Like, crazed gnats is actually a really kind of common one, which is, you know, considering 45% of the electorate voted nationalists, it's actually a bit of an insult to, you know, the sort of thinking people of Scotland. One aspect of the campaign that came out of my research, um, and it was actually, the findings were more than expected than even I was, I, I thought might actually transpire, was, as a lot of you might have noticed, when you submitted your ballot on the 18th, it wasn't Alex Salmon's name that was on the ballot paper, but if you were actually follow the line of the UK media, you could be like tricked into thinking that was the case is across the spectrum, and this is not just uh, in the UK papers, it is worse than the UK papers, but this, this affects the Herald, it affects the Scotsman, it affects the entirety of uh, the UK media, as they try to personalise this debate, um, not as a collective um, constitutional decision, and the biggest one that had happened for three centuries, it was presented as one man's idea, and we were being conned into following it. 
like uh, like rats following the Pied Piper. It was almost like this sort of uh, this sort of like Jim Jones type uh, type personification, of Alex Salmon. That he was this cult leader, and we all we were all just going along with it, and you know, getting delivered to the poison dying brew or whatever. But one of the the main things that came out of my research was the fact that. Uh, if you looked at articles that were to do with the referendum, um, so it was explicitly to do with the referendum, and they contained someone's name in the title, and that could be anyone's name. It could be, uh, you know, Brown, uh, you know, Blair. Even when he came in, Cameron, Osborne, etc. It could even be ones like Bowie and Putin who were just brought in. When you quantify that, every uh, of all the names that are used in headlines to do with the referendum, 57% of them are Alex Salmond. More than half of them. At Alex Salmon, they've tried to like narrow this debate down to one man, and it's a complete obfuscation and a complete deliberate distortion of the facts. But a lot of people have fell for it. Like I've actually had people come up to me and say, "Oh, what? Well, I don't want to vote for Alex Salmon," but that wasn't what was on the ballot paper. Um, and another thing that people have said to me is like, "Well, the newspapers do personify or do personalise debates to an individual, such as you know Osborne and the economy, uh, Cameron and conservatism." But in this particular instance, in terms of like the Scottish independence referendum, this was done to Alex Salmon to a degree which surpassed any other individual massively. Right? The closest you get was David Cameron, and that's about 10% of them, which is ironic considering he didn't even engage Salmon in a debate, even though there was constant uh, claims for it or constant calls for it. But what's more interesting is the fact that the respective leaders of both campaigns better together in Yes Scotland were Alistair Darling and Nicola Sturgeon. And again, if you count up the mentions of Alex Salmon's name, he was in 57% of them. Okay, almost 6 in 10. If you put Alistair Darling and Nicola Sturgeon together, it's barely 4%. Okay, so if we look at that, that's, oh, that, that to me illustrates how the media deliberately, perhaps knowing that he didn't enjoy the, the same personal popularity that some other pop, or, or he didn't enjoy the same popularity that a more abstract notion of independence might hold tried to make the debate all about him and when you actually get into the text it's even worse it's words like salmon's acolytes salmon's disciples salmon's followers and it's this idea that 45 percent of this country were just conned into following the the wishes of one man I was invited onto the BBC and I was actually kind of, regardless of other people's opinions, I was, I was grateful for the opportunity to go on there, purely because, as you can imagine, the press will not touch this research, right? It's a bit like giving someone a really ugly selfie of themselves and then expecting them to put it on Facebook as their profile picture, so I was maybe being a bit naive in that regard, but I did think some other avenues would pick it up and some people on Twitter, etc., have been like good enough to do that and I'm, I'm glad that people are discussing it. But when I got onto the BBC, that wasn't the first time they'd actually invited me on. They actually contacted me on the 11th of September, asking if I could contribute to a debate in Dundee on one of their roadshows the next morning at half past eight. And as much as it would be difficult for me to get to Dundee that time, I agreed to it. But they clearly hadn't actually read any of the stuff I'd written on this or what my actual findings were. And when they came, uh, when a producer contacted me later on and I actually explained my findings, not only did they actually argue with me, despite the fact that they hadn't done any of the research themselves, they said that uh, they would get back to me later that evening and, surprise, surprise, they got through to me, through my mother actually, that um, <clears throat> there was no longer a slot on the show, right, after they'd found out my findings and then I get no cut, I get no contact whatsoever until after the referendum. So as much as, you know, from my own personal standpoint, I can say, right, well, it was, I was lucky that the BBC gave me that brief forum at, you know, half past seven in the morning to discuss my research. But at the same time, as if they thought it was important and it was noteworthy, why didn't they bring it in before the 18th? But I think we all know that. Okay, so I mean, if we were talking about, you know, any potential future for the Scottish press or sort of like, where do they go now? Especially now that they've been seeing that they took a deliberate side in what was such a, you know, monumentally important decision. And we were all sort of, you know, well, not all of us, but a lot of us were hoodwinked and conned and believing this establishment line, which was, you know, a lot of it was 
it was a sort of distortion at best and it was a blatant lie at worst and because of this this isn't necessarily my own opinion it's more what I'm seeing on Twitter and on Facebook newspapers were already in decline the revenues and sales are going down by about 10% a year anyway um, before this happened but now online you're seeing actual um, boycotting campaigns regards some of these um, mirroring what some people are saying we should be doing regards to the BBC and the licence fee and this isn't a minority fringe group this is, this is spreading across society and I'm seeing it you know being retweeted left right and centre by no means do I think the newspaper industry is dead. I mean, the Sun occupies such an important uh, role in sort of British popular culture um, and such an important role in the market. Uh, that's not going anywhere. The people that read the Daily Mail and the Daily Express knew what those views are and actually want to have those views reinforced. So that's not going to change anything. The more sort of interesting one might be the Daily Record because the staunchly and almost blindly pro Labour stance has actually let them down and it's, it's, it's shown that you know the whole thing on the front page Scotland's champion is almost laughably bad the fact that they actually put that up there I mean at least uh, at least the Express will say better together and they go along with it and they mean it and um, the daily I'm not saying that uh, you're going to see any newspapers fold under this um, but I think the readership of a few of them is going to be dramatically affected and not in a good way Use a doctor who's sick, who